Zeches Megillah Daf Yud Dalid continues the Gemara's explanation of the Megillah, but quickly moves into a discussion of the forty-eight Nevi'im and seven Nevi'os that Kali Yisrael had. The Gemara will discuss if there were other Nevi'im and who the seven Nevi'os were and how we know that they were those that those women were Nevi'os. We'll also speak about them a little bit. We'll speak about Avigail and Chana and uh, Chulda and Devora specifically as well. So the Gemara begins. The king took his ring off his finger and he gave it to Haman to sign his decree against the Jews, says the Gemara. Rabbi Abba Barakahana says the removal of the ring was greater than the 48 prophets and prophetesses and the seven prophetesses which said Nevuah to Kal Yisrael in order to try to get them to do tshuva. They all were not able to get Kal Yisrael to change the ways, but just taking the ring off the finger, that threat was. Says the Gemara, we have a brisa that there were 48 Nevi'im. And seven Nivios that said prophecy to Kal Yisrael, not more, and not uh, they did not add and they did not detract anything from the mitzvahs of the Torah except for Megillah, the reading of Megillah Sester. Um, now Rashi explains Hanukkah happened later after the Nevi'im were around, so that 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 was not part of the things that they added. The only thing they added was the mitzvah of Purim and Megillas. Uh, Esther. How did they know that they should add that? So the Gemara says, Yeshua ben Karcha learned that when they left slavery of Mitzrayim, they said Shira. So therefore, when they went from being decreed to be killed to being able to live, certainly that was a reason to say Shira. And their reading of the Megillah counts as a Shira. So the Gemara says, well, if the reading of the Megillah counts as a Shira, why don't we say real Shira? Why don't we say Halel on per? So the Gemara offers three answers. Number one, you don't say halal on a miracle that happened in Chutzarot. You only say halal on a miracle that happened outside uh, Eretz Yisrael. So the Gemara says, what do you mean? Mitzrayim happened outside of Eretz Yisrael. How could you say halal on that? The Gemara answers, we have a brisa that says, until Kal Yisrael got into Eretz Yisrael, you could say halal on a miracle that happened outside of Eretz Yisrael. Once it got into Eretz Yisrael, you can no longer say halal on such a miracle. Therefore, the the miracle of the Purim story, which happened after they had already entered Yisrael, they couldn't say halal on that anymore. Now you have two other answers, and the Gemara is going to ask, what are these two answers? They have other reasons they didn't say halal. That seems to imply that they could have said halal. So the Gemara asks, how could they have said halal? The Bryson just said, you can't say halal on a nace that happened outside of Yisrael. So the Gemara is going to say, well, no, they hold that the Bryson means that while they were in Eretz Yisrael, they couldn't say Halal on a miracle that happened outside Eretz Yisrael. Once they left Eretz Yisrael, they were able to go back and say Halal on miracles that happened outside Eretz Yisrael. So anyway, they give two other reasons why we don't say Halal on Purim. Rav Nachman says the reading of the Megillah counts as a Halal, and therefore you don't need an additional Halal. Rav says, because you have a Pasuk that says, Halalu Avde Hashem. You only say Halal if you're Avde Hashem. Avde Hashem meaning you're not subservient to any other king. So after the departure from Mitzrayim, they were not servient to any other king. They were free of Paro. But here we were still slaves to Hashverosh, and therefore we could not free ourselves from, uh, since we didn't free ourselves from Hashverosh, we could not say halal at all. So nothing more asks, what do you mean there were only 48 prophets and no more? We have a puzzle that says, in describing uh, Shmuel, it says, V'hi isha chad min ramasayim tzayfim. It was one man from ramasayim tzayfim. Now ramasayim tzayfim, we interpreted it to mean one of masayim tzayfim, one of 200 seers, one of 200 prophets that said nevuah for Kla Yisrael. So how can you tell me there were only 48? Sigma so says, yes, there were a lot. There were well more than 48. As a matter of fact, we have a Brisa that says that there were twice as many prophets as there were people who went out of Mitzrayim. So 600,000 people went out of Mitzrayim, so there were 1.2 million prophets in Kla Yisrael's history. However, only 48 of them said Nebuah, which was meant to be recorded for all generations, which was a message to all generations. The other one just said prophecy concerning their specific situation. Now, more explanations of that phrase, har, uh, Haram Tzayfim, which was referring to Elkano, came from Haram Osayim Tzayfim. So the Gemara says, one additional explanation is that it's from two Ramos Shetzayfos, it's two mountains that look at each other, meaning they face each other across the valley. And the second explanation is that it's from two, it's from people who stand people who stand at the peak of the world and those are Bnei Korach, the sons of Korach 
like it says, Bnei Korach's children, the uh, Korach's children did not die with the Korach, they fell in the hole, but they got a little peak where they landed, and they avoided falling into Gehenna because they did tshuva. Okay, those are the 48 Nevi'im. Now the Gemara discusses the seven Nevi'os, the seven prophetesses. So who are they? So the Gemara says they are Sarah, Miriam, Devorah, Chana, Avigail, Chulda, and Esther. And how do we know each one? So Sarah, it says, Avi Milka va'avi Yiska. It refers to Sarah's father as the father of Milka and the father of Yiska. The Gemara says Yiska refers to Sarah. The word Yiska is from the word Soche. Either it means that she was a seer. She could see. She saw with Ruach HaKodesh. Like Hashem told Avram, anything Sarah says, listen to her voice, because her prophecy is greater than yours. Or, another explanation of Yiska is that everybody looked at her because of her beauty. Now, Miriam is explicitly called in Nevi'ah. It says, Vatikach Miriam HaNevi'ah Achois Aaron. Miriam, the prophetess, sister of Aaron, took the drum and she led the rest of the women in uh, singing Shira. Tamar asks, okay, it says she's in Nevi'ah, but why is it called the sister of Aaron? She was the sister of Moshe too. Tamar says, because her prophecy was only when she was the sister of Aaron. At the time of her prophecy, Moshe wasn't born yet, because her prophecy was that Moshe was going to be born, and she said there was a son who's going to be born from my mother, who's going to save Kal Yisrael. Now, when he was born, the entire house filled with light, the Gemara says, and her father kissed her on her head, because her prophecy seemed to have been fulfilled. He said to her, my daughter, your prophecy has been fulfilled. But then, when he ended up being thrown in the river, he slapped her on her head and she said, my daughter, what happened to your prophecy doesn't seem like it's going to be fulfilled. But that's why she stood on the riverbank to watch what would happen because she wanted to see what would happen with her prophecy in the end. She knew that it would be fulfilled. Now the one talks about Devorah. So Devorah is explicitly called Devorah Isha Nevi'ah Isha Lapidos. Devorah was a prophetess and the wife of Lapidos. Mar says, why does it say the wife of Lapidos? We don't know who Lapidos is. What's the point in saying that? Mar says, because she made wicks for the base of Migdash. Lapidos meaning a flame, and she made wicks for those flames. Now, more about the It says that she sat and she judged Klai under a tomer, under a palm tree. Mar says, why do we need to know what type of tree it was? Mar says that she sat outdoors to avoid Yichud, and she chose a tree that had very high branches, so it shouldn't provide privacy, so that she wouldn't have any issues of Yichud, of being isolated together with a man who came to ask her anything. Another explanation is that a tamar has only one trunk, there are no branches coming off it, and that the Gemara refers to as having one heart. Kali Yisrael and her generation also had only one heart towards their father in heaven. Okay, now about Chana. So Chana says, Vatispa al Chana, Chana was mispal after she had her child, after she had Shmuel, and she said, Allah is leaving Hashem. My heart is glad for Hashem. Rama karni Hashem. Uh, great is my horn to Hashem. So my horn refers to the horn that was filled with oil that was used to anoint kings. And she was saying that people who are anointed from a horn will do better, they will be exalted more than those who are anointed from a actual flask. She said, Rama karni. She didn't say Rama pachi. Now the Pesukim clearly described who was anointed by what. David and Shlemi were anointed from a horn, it says so explicitly, and their kingdom lasted. Shaul and Yehu were anointed from a cup, from a flask, from a pach, and their kingdom did not last very long. Okay, more about Chanas Tevilah. She said, Ein Kadosh Kashem Ki Bil Techa. So the Gemara says, Not Ein Bil Techa, but Ein Levalo Secha. So there is none holy like Hashem. There is none besides you, as well as there is none who can outlast you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not like mankind. Mankind makes something, and what we create lasts longer than we do. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu creates and does not last longer than him, because nothing outlasts HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Then she said, Ein Sur Kelekenu, there is no rock like our God, and you read that as Ain Sire Kalakano, there's no artist like her God, who, if a person draws a drawing or a form of any sort on a wall, he cannot give life to it. He cannot give intestines, he cannot make it function. Akash Baruch Hu, though, draws an image within an image when he makes a woman pregnant with a child, and he puts inside spirit, soul, innards, intestines, everything you need. All right, now what about Avigail? So Avigail, it says, She was riding on the donkey and coming down the hidden of the mountain. So what was happening here was that David HaMelech had requested assistance from Novel, her husband. Novel had refused. David had decided he was a rebel, Mord Bamalchus, and he planned on putting him to death. On that, Avigail came down the mountain to speak on behalf of her husband, and it, she calls it, it's called the hidden mountain. Where it says it's not the hidden mountain, it should say that she was hidden by the mountain. 
So the Gemara says, no, she came on the matter of things which were hidden. What did she do? She had the following strategy. She brought Dam Nida, she brought blood to David HaMelech to give a psak. So he said, you're not allowed to paskin Maras, you cannot um, paskin blood at night. So she said, well, you also cannot paskin Dini Nefashas at night. You cannot paskin capital punishment at night, and you're planning on ruling at night that my husband deserves capital punishment for rebelling against you. So, Devin answered, there's no judgment. Somebody who rebels against the king is put to death without a court case. I don't need to judge him. So she said, uh, okay, wait a second. You're not a king yet. Shaul is still the king. You have not, you've been anointed, but since you haven't been recognized, you do not count as a king as far as the halacha. Now, David accepted that, and he said, Blessed are you, and blessed is your reasoning, that you saved me from bloods. So he says, bloods? What two bloods? You saved him from one blood, from killing your husband. He says, no, he also saved her. she also saved him from Damnida, because she had exposed her leg briefly, and it shone, gave light for the distance of three parsois. David had seen that, and he had said to her, be with me, and she said, this is going to be a trap for you, because I'm Anita, and that's why, that's what happened when she showed her the blood, and he sa- she saved him from violating the Isser of Nida. Now she said to him, this is going to be a trap for you, Umar says that implies this is going to be something else that is also going to be a trap for you, Umar says that's referring to the incident with Basheva, which was also going to be a trap. Now when they were parting from each other and she was leaving, she said, when Hashem will do well for my master, remember me, implying that when the time comes and I'm available, come back and we will see if we can marry each other. Now, Rav Nachman said when a woman speaks, she's spinning a yarn, she's creating other things, even though she was came to advocate for her husband, she still gave this message. Others say when a goose walks, its head is down, but its eyes are to the heaven. Even though she's saying humble things, she still has great aspirations. Now, I didn't know Hulda was a Nevia, so it says, Vayelach Chilkiyo HaKoyen V'Achikom V'Achbar. What happened here? They went to Hulda Nevia. So the so you can explicitly say that Hulda was a Nevia. The uh, incident that happened was that Yoshio, who was a king who had not know Torah, had uh, heard from Chilkiyo, the Kohen, that he found a Torah scroll, the original Torah scroll of Moshe, Rabbeinu in the base of Migdash and was rolled up to the Tochacha, it was rolled up to the curses that before Kaisa, if they don't do what they're supposed to. And Yoshio had thought that that was a message to him that his generation wasn't doing properly, and he had sent these three to go ask Kolda Hanavia. So Umar asks, first of all, why was she saying Nevia? This was in the time of Yermio Hanavi, who was around during the reign of Yoshio. Second of all, uh, why did they send, why did he send them to her? So where it says, Yermio didn't mind, she was a relative, and therefore there was no problem that she said Nevua, and as to why the king sent them to her instead of to him. So where it gives two answers. First of all, Umar says, because women are more kind, they have more mercy, or Achmonios, and he was hoping that she would be misfiled for them. And the second reason is that Yermio was not around. Yermio had gone to try to get back the ten lost tribes, the Yasser Shvatim, who were exiled by Melch Ashur, who wanted to bring them back, and he was successful. Umar says, how do you know that? was successful because later we have a prophecy where he says Ki it's Yecheskel says Ki lo Yashab will no longer have the halachos of Yovol and when you sell something you get your land back so uh, you're not going to get your land back anymore now the rule of Yovol is that it only applies if the majority of Chal Yisrael are living on the land so if the ten Shvatim had been lost it didn't have a majority and the rule of Yovol already didn't apply so what is he saying in the future the rule of Yovo will not apply. That's already the state. It must be that it was restored because Kaisal had come back from the uh, exile. And Mar says, okay, what happened then when they came back? Mar says they were ruled by Yoshio, king of Yehuda, also ruled over the Ten Shatim at that time. Where do you see that? Where's the two sources? First of all, he was able to tell people living in Veskel, which is in Malchus Yisrael, what to do. Like it says, He said, he went to Veskel and he said, What is this memorial that I see? The people of the city said, It's the grave of a man of God, who came from Yehuda, and he said the following prophecy about what was happening on the Mizbeach in Vezkel. Now, Yeshua was there, and he was telling them what to do. He also destroyed that Mizbeach, because it was for Avodah Zarah. So you see that he clearly was ruling over the Asar Sashvatim. Second source is, it says, uh, is that it says, Gam Yehuda Shas Ketzir, Lach Beshuvi Shvos Ami. Yehuda was Shas Ketzir. He uh, harvested crops. The Gemara says that means that he ruled over the return of the exiles. Okay. 
We have one prophetess left, and that is Esther. Where do you see that? She was Einavia. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third day. Esther put on royalty. Marsa Zvihibia Mashlishi Vatilbash Esther Malchus on the third now the Gemara comments on a, uh, it has a critical statement of Devorah and Chulda. The Gemara says that a woman should not take command. You have two women who did, and they were too haughty. And they are Devorah and Chulda, who are called, their names mean the bee and the weasel, so those are low names to show that a criticism of them. Devorah, because it says, Vatishach Vatikra Levarach, she wanted that she called Varak to come to her, she didn't go to him. And about Chulda, it says, Amru Ish. They, she told them, she told the three, go back and tell the man. She didn't say go back and tell the king. It was not a respectful way to refer to the king. Now the Gemara says, Chulda was a grandchild of Yehoshua. Like it says about uh, Chulda, it says, Ben Acharchas. And about Yeshua, it says, Betimnas Cheres. The Gemara she couldn't have been a grandchild of Yeshua. She was a grandchild of um, Rachav the Zona. Where do you see that? Because we say, we have a price that says that there were eight Nevi'im that came from Rachav HaZona. Uh, they were Kahanim also. And they are Nerya, Baruch, Sharia, Machsaya, Yirmya, Chilkiah, Hanamel, and Shalom. And if you the adds also Chulda. So you see that Chulda was descended from Rachav, not from, uh, you couldn't possibly be from Yehoshua. Rachav was a Zona and she also was a guy. So Gemara says this question was asked by someone called Eino Saba. So it was asked to Rav Nachman who said it. So uh, he said, Eina Saba, or according to others, he said, Black Kli, uh, you and I go together very well. What happened was is that Rachav converted, and she did tshuva, and she married Yeshua, and they, these descendants came from the two of them together. Versus can't be. Yeshua had no sons, like it says. Yeshua bin, it says about Yeshua, Nun bin Yeshua, and that's it. It's the end of the line. It doesn't say that Yeshua had any kids. Or it says he didn't have any sons, but he did have daughters.